Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Tim, I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Uh, I say addict, uh, I don't know if this is an open or closed meeting, but uh, I say addict because I, while I am an alcoholic, I'm also addicted to, as many of you probably also are, anything and everything. Uh, drugs, alcohol, sex, food, uh, whatever. And uh, it wasn't until I got into the program that I realized that I was addicted to everything, everything you can, you know, everything under the sun. Um, but how I got into the program was, uh, uh, you know, I I definitely tried many times to quit drinking. It was always quit drinking because drinking led to all the other things, all the other outside issues that would go up my nose um, <laughs> or smoke or, or whatever. Uh, and I would always do really well for a week or two weeks, maybe a month if I was lucky. And I would, I don't know if I was treating myself, I can, I can drink one night. And of course I would drink one night and maybe, maybe I wouldn't drink the next day. Maybe I'd spend another week off or a few days off, but I always ended up back in the same place, uh, leaving the bar when it would close to go find drugs. Um, and, uh, three, almost three years ago. I found myself alone, which is how I liked to get fucked up. I like to get fucked up alone. I think I would start the evenings out with, around other people, but I always just wanted to be alone and uh, to be able to do it my way. But so, I, like uh, any other evening, I ended up by myself, um, ingested, I don't know how much alcohol and how many drugs, but had a... I guess what I would call a nervous breakdown. I reached out to a friend the next morning and was told to go to CDRP at Kaiser Hospital. Um, I don't know why I went other than I thought if I didn't go, I was going to die. I was convinced that somehow I lived through that night. I don't know what saved me. I, Still don't know what saved me from dying that night. Uh, but I made it to CDRP. I think I did a 30-day program. Um, and then when I got done, I felt this sense of relief, but also this sense of sheer anxiety because I didn't know what was next. I didn't know how I was going to stay sober for another day, let alone 30 more days. Um and a friend of mine who knew that I was in rehab or just gotten out of rehab and wanted to quit drinking convinced me to go to a meeting because she didn't want to go alone. I went to a meeting with her. I think she found me a sponsor that night. She might have been to another meeting before me, I believe, but she she was still on the fence. I know she was still drinking, uh, but she had attended meetings. Found me a sponsor. Started working the steps, I think, the next week. Went to 90 and 90. Now, 90 means 90 days. Um, and as I progressed through working the steps and working with my sponsor and going to meetings and meeting all of you and uh, and many other people, um, I found a better way to live. I didn't know it. And I didn't know it till very, fairly recently that I had found a better way to live uh, because I'm still alive. <laughs> and uh, I work a really shitty program. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, I just moved back to town about a week ago. I was extremely dry and had been to a meeting for about three months and came back and jumped right back in like I'd never left. Um, and I feel great. I mean, as good as I can. Uh, I'm really happy to be back and uh, to be able to attend meetings uh, with people that I care for and people that have good things to say and some people have shitty things to say as well. 
I I mean, I don't necessarily. I still don't uh, see myself as. Uh, I don't know. I I feel like AA has a lot for me. Maybe it doesn't have everything. Maybe I have to fill in the rest of that. Maybe I have to trust my higher power. Um, but I know that I I would I would be dead without this program. Um, how much more time do I have? Six minutes. Six. That was four minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I prepared for this for the six minutes before that, since I was told I was speaking. Um, so I came back. I moved to I moved to Texas uh, eight months ago. Uh, if you'd asked me then, I'm sure I would have had a great reason why. I don't. I don't remember why anymore. Uh, other than I just had to get the fuck out of here. Uh, I really needed uh, five minutes. All right. I really needed to change from everything that was here. I, I lived in the Bay Area for 20 years. Uh, I had a business here, which I ran to the fucking ground. Um, in the end, I was selling drugs out of my business to keep my, my habit alive. Um, I'd burned so many bridges. I was convinced that I had nothing here, even though this is where I got sober and stayed sober for longer than any other time in my life. Uh, but I went to Texas. I could reconnect with my family, which was amazing. I thought I'd destroyed those relationships. And, of course, at, at first... At first, I got there, and, like, no one was... None of these fucking people want to talk to me. And they I don't think they did want to talk to me. I don't think they trusted me. I don't think they thought much of me. Um, and it was... Through the tools that I learned in this program that I was able to be there for them when they needed me, um, to offer up help in any way that I could. And I guess in that respect, I owe this program more than just my life, but my ability to reconnect with my family. Um, and then, <laughs> so I came back to to the Bay um, because I felt so isolated. I was very isolated out there. The meetings are very different. I don't know how many of you have traveled to the South and gone to meetings. Um, they're very different. They're very rigid. And I mentioned about the open and closed meetings uh, earlier because I walked out of several meetings that were closed that had turned away uh, addicts that had come in uh, that had come into the meetings and were basically told to shut the fuck up. And that really, you know, that turned me off of going to meetings there. Uh, so coming back here, it was a, I was able to breathe a sigh of relief. Um, while I may not agree with every concept of uh, this program, I know that we, we wouldn't turn away someone in need that came through the door just because they like to smoke crack instead of drink liquor. I know we wouldn't turn them away. Uh, so it's great to be back. I don't know how many minutes that is, but I'm going to call it done. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Ivy. I'm an alcoholic. And I like to stand. I don't like to, but <laughs> I was told to by someone in my early sobriety. So I stand up. Um, it's nice to see you all here. It was really nice to be welcomed at the door, and nice that there are snacks, and um, I think those things are really important. Uh, they make a meeting feel welcoming, people smiling at you and introducing themselves to you and shaking hands with you, and um, I don't know. You don't. I mean, I don't go to church, but maybe that's what church might be like, but people just welcoming you, and for me... Um, this is my spiritual place, and so um, it feels like coming home when I come to a meeting. Um, it hasn't always been like that for me. I've gone through periods where I really wasn't into AA, and I definitely pulled away, and I drifted away, and I became contemptuous, and um, 
dismissive and just thought it wasn't for me and I didn't like it anymore. And, um, you know, I was very fortunate that I didn't relapse during those periods, but I can tell you that I became very dry, um, very angry, um, very emotionally unstable, uh, de- overly dependent on others for my sense of well-being and happiness and, um, more isolated. So, um, I just want to start with my day today because it's just kind of, this is just a little snapshot of where I'm at today. I woke up early on a Saturday, um, went to this meeting that I just recently started going to. I don't even know what it's called, but it's in Montclair. My sponsor goes there. So I followed her there and they've got really great speakers. I heard this woman this morning with just 20 months who just like blew my mind. She was amazing. And, um, and then I went out for breakfast with my sponsor and we reread step two and I was like, oh, this is so great. I'm so spiritual and <laughs> life is so good and higher power. Yeah. And all this stuff. And then I got home and I like got in a fight with my boyfriend because I was being an asshole and, um, because I'm human and, um, had to like apologize and look at my behavior and, um, really try to amend that habit that I have of taking my whatever stress or anxiety I have out on others. And so I had to kind of regroup and we walked to Piedmont and did like a couple of errands. And then I picked up my friend from San Francisco, who's one of my sober sisters from there. Um, and we went and got our toenails done. We got pedicures in Piedmont and then had a lovely lunch And then I came back home and, like, finished my jigsaw puzzle of cats doing yoga, which, (laughs) which, by the way, both my sister-in-law and my mother got me. They got me the exact same puzzle, so apparently they don't talk about what are you getting Ivy for Christmas, but I had two of them. I gave one away, but I did enjoy it thoroughly, and I finished my jigsaw puzzle, and then I got ready to come here, and Michelle, thank you for asking me to speak. She just texted me this afternoon, and... Believe me, I had plans. I had plans for 8 o'clock tonight, and that was to watch a movie on the couch <laughs> and had some popcorn. But I said to my boyfriend, you know, it's really important for me that I say yes to AA when I'm asked, and so would you please come with me? And he said, okay. So <laughs> thank you for coming with me. Um, and and it's good to be here um, because this place, you know, as Tim was saying, this place saved my life. Um, and my very lovely and sober and also very mundane day today was not what I thought my life would look like. It's not what I expected my life to look like. It's not necessarily what I wanted my life to look like. Um, but I'll tell you about what my life looked like. So, um, originally from New York, I grew up in Westchester, which is the suburbs of New York city. And both my parents were teachers in the city. Um, and they both taught high school. And so from a very young age, I would go to school with my mom or my dad and hang out with the kids, the teenagers. And I just thought that teenagers were the coolest. Like I couldn't wait to become a teenager. And my mom worked at um, music and art, which is the fame school. And so it was an exciting place to be. I mean, they were like singing in the hallway and like (laughs) doing pirouettes down, you know, I mean, it was kind of like the movie there's like art and, you know, I would get to go and hang out in the orchestra room and listen to music. And it was, it was really exciting, um, to be there But really, I just thought teenagers were great. And um, so I couldn't wait to kind of like grow up and be cool and be a teenager. And then what happened was, I think for many years after that, until I got sober, and maybe even a few years after that, I just kind of stayed a teenager. Like it was just kind of the sweet spot of like, of like, um, you know, self-righteousness and arrogance and anger and... um, (laughs) you know, rebelliousness and defiance and, um, wanting to fit in, but not wanting to be like anyone else, uh, being really immature emotionally, um, having really grandiose ideas about myself and, and, um, 
And uh, that's because I started drinking and using around 12, 13, 14. Um, and they say that you arrest your, your development when you start using in earnest. And um, so I think that I just really froze my myself, my psyche in that phase of development. And it, it has taken a long time to grow out of that. Um, for me, just my story, my experience. Um, but so I started drinking and using, and I thought like, this is awesome. Like I'm finally like a cool teenager. Like I can smoke pot and I can get these guys who hang around the liquor store to buy me liquor. And, um, I can, you know, get wasted with my friends. And, um, you know, as soon as I got high, I just thought like, why wouldn't you want to do this every day? Like this is the jam. And so I pretty much, you know, I did like all through high school. Um, I was kind of a weekend warrior, but, um, I got in with like the group of, I, to start with, I was a very like, dedicated student. I loved school. I was a good student. I was whatever, um, hardworking and kind of a brown noser. And then, um, once I got to high school, I just wanted to be cool. And so I started hanging out with like the seniors who smoked at the wall. And the next thing you knew, they're inviting me and my friends to their parties. And then, you know, we're getting high all the time and they're selling us drugs and, we're going to all these keggers in the woods and I don't know if anyone can identify. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. And, uh, and you know, like very quickly, one thing led to the next. It was just like, as soon as I smoked weed, I, I mean, soon after that I was taking acid and soon after that I was doing this and I was doing that and I was doing that. It was just like, yeah, sure. More and more. Let's try this. Let's try that. Um, you know, my home life wasn't terrible, but wasn't terrible growing up, but, um, right around that same time when I entered high school, my parents d- told me and my brother that they were getting a divorce and I was very surprised. I, they weren't like fighting, screaming at each other. Um, so it was, it was a shock to my system. And, um, I think that that also obviously had effect, a, a big effect on my development at that time. And those two things just coincided. And so, I just started lying and stealing and staying out and saying I was at this friend's house, but I was really at this guy's house and, you know, doing all these things that I, um, that wasn't good for me. And, you know, my, my school performance of course started to drop and, um, (laughs) and whereas, you know, just a couple of markers, like my freshman year, I was like freshman class president and I was like on student council and I was like poetry editor of the arts and literary magazine. And then, you know, that was it. I was playing, uh, I was playing field hockey. So I was like doing all the high school stuff. And then, um, all I wanted to do was like, I would go off in the woods at lunch and get high and then go back to class and like doodle on my paper. Um, so anyway, fast forward, When I got to college, I said, I'm done with partying. I got that all out in high school. And I really thought that that was true. And I, again, I just like stuck my nose up at these like people, you know, like uh, my sweet mates and my roommates who were like going out and getting wasted for like the first time. And I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. Like I've done all that, you know, and I'm just not going to drink. And, but I couldn't stay away from a drink. And so, um, I, you know, continued my drinking. And, um, I ended up getting really depressed. I'd been depressed in high school and I got really depressed in college. And, um, there was, I did not know that there was a connection between like putting a depressant in your body regularly (laughs) and actually becoming depressed. Um, and I, things got really dark and, you know, I had like suicidal ideation and I, I remember going to the school counselor at college and they, they wanted to put me on medication and this was 1992 or 93. And I was like, what? I'm not going to put drugs in my body. (laughs) I'm not going to alter my consciousness with your pharmaceuticals, you know? And I, I really got mad and she was like, well, then I don't know what 
I don't know what I can do for you. And what I heard was like, you're hopeless, you know? And I don't think that that's what she meant, but I definitely heard like, you're hopeless. Um, I ended up f- calling this like uh, therapist that I had seen. She had this little office on main street above this dance and yoga studio. And I didn't really no no one was really doing yoga back then th- that I knew. And, um, Anyway, I, I called up this woman and I was like, I'm crying. And I was like, um, the, the school counselor said no one can help me and I need help. And she was like, okay, okay, I'll see you. So I started seeing this woman and she was, um, she was amazing. And, uh, she was very new age and I didn't know what that was, but she like, she gave me like Marianne Williamson book and she like talked to me about the Course in Miracles and she was like, um, she gave me a, a 10 class pass to the yoga studio. And she was like trying to say like, life is bigger than what you're seeing right now, which is like, you know, through your lens of depression. I didn't know at the time that I had a problem with alcohol. I did not know that I was an alcoholic at all. I had such a veil. So I don't, I didn't tell her that I was drinking a lot or that I was using or whatever. I told her I had a really shitty relationship. My boyfriend went, to um, SUNY Purchase downstate, and we would I would drive six hours all night from I went upstate SUNY Geneseo. I went all the way down there and crying and drama, and then he'd come up here and drama, and it was just like crazy. It was like codependent and crazy. Um, but she was like kind of this first person in my life who like shined a little ray of light and was kind of like there's there's more out there um, than what you are seeing right now in your narrow vision. Um, so. When I was a junior in college, instead of studying abroad, I decided to um, do like a semester. I had this friend who did this semester on a Native American reservation, and I had been really interested in Indians and Native American life, and I was like, that sounds cool. I'm going to do that. So I ended up living and working on this um, Dakota reservation called the Sisseton Wapiton Reservation. And wouldn't you know it, my placement, my service placement was in a treatment center. So I got to work with as sort of like a support person. And, a, and you know, I also helped in the classroom. Um, these teenagers who I just turned 20. So I was just not a teenager anymore. Um, and these were kids who were, um, you know, obviously they were addicts and alcoholics. And I was there... And, you know, I was being exposed to AA for the first time. Um, I got to sit in on some of their meetings. If they were open, they they would let us um, interns or whatever we were called, volunteers, sit in. And I was just like, this is so interesting. And so one day I got my hands on, they had those Hazleton workbooks. And I was like, hmm, like who would even pick that up unless, right? So something I, huh, let me see. Oh, let me fill this out. Oh, yeah. What is my drinking and drug history? Oh, shit. I've done a lot of drinking and drugging in my, you know, however many years, seven years of, you know, since I started. How interesting. And I said to myself, well, I'll just stop. I'll say I'm in this treatment center. I want to show solidarity. You know, I want to be like a mentor type of person and show them that like sobriety can be cool. So I'll just stop. And um, so then I would go out with some of my my colleagues or whatever, the other people who were with me and we'd go to the bar and I would get a drink and they'd be like, I thought you weren't drinking. I'd be like, "Ah!" you know, (laughs) well, you know, I'm just not going to drink. Like, I don't know what I thought, but I like, I'm not going to drink in front of the kids. Like I I just, it just didn't have any sticking. It was like Teflon. It was like, I'm just not going to drink, but I had no defense against the first drunk. I did not even know what that what that looked like the first drink, which would get me drunk. I had no idea, um, how to, how to do that. And so I would just brush it aside. I didn't think that I had a problem. And so my justification was, well, not really, I'm not an alcoholic. I was just trying to do it to be like in solidarity. Um, so, um, so then, so that was interesting too, because that was my first exposure to the program. And that was also an exposure to, um, my first concept that there was a higher power because, um, one of the people there, um, they invited me out to some sweat lodges and I started going with the kids to these sweat lodges. And I ended up meeting a family that kind of took me in 
Um, and you know, long story, da, 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 but they, I started going to these sweat lodges and I was like, and something, something happened to me. I did not know what I'd never prayed before. And in this sweat lodge, you would like pray out loud. And I did not know what to say. I did not know what to do. And I was just kind of like copying other people and what I thought you should do or what I thought you should say. But let me tell you that, that it did have some kind of transformational effect on me. And I did feel some power greater than myself when I was in that environment with, with these people. And so, so that experience was, was huge for me. Um, when I graduated, um, college, I decided to move to Atlanta because mm, (laughs) it's kind of like Tim. I was just like, I just got to get the fuck out of here. I just got to get, I just need a change of environment. And I had had a cousin who was living down there who said, it's cool. There's like lots of artists and there's great music scene and you should come. And I was like, okay, because I had a degree in theater and English literature and was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. I'll go down to Atlanta. So I moved down there and, um, you know, geographics took myself with me. Same thing, drinking, working in bars, not really doing anything with my life. Um, of significance, except like causing wreckage. And after a few years, I was like, um, you know, what am I doing in Georgia? You know, like Atlanta's the problem. I'm going to move, move back to New York. You know, what am I doing here? Like, this is, this is the reason I'm not successful. I'm in Atlanta, you know, and I should be in New York. You know, I should be like acting. And, um, so I went to New York and guess what? <laughs> Same thing. I was working in nightclubs and I was waitressing and I was taking some acting classes here and there, but I wasn't, um, I was just waiting to be discovered really. (laughs) (laughs) And what's funny is I did work at this cafe that was sort of like, you know, it was very bohemian and they would have like theater groups come in to like rehearse. And one day they asked me to stand in and play a waitress. I was like, I got this. (laughs) I "I can do this. But, um, but afterwards they were like, that was really good. Like you, you should, um, you should join our troop, you know? So in a way I had these, op- I, and I had multiple opportunities and I would be like, okay. And then I just never would follow through. I was just, I was scared to actually pursue my dream and I was happy. Thank you. I was happy, um, to stay in my container of drinking and using and not really having to and, and being able to blame other things, you know? So it's time to get sober. <laughs> After 10, 11 years of this in New York, not doing, not doing my dream, just waitressing, working in nightclubs, being miserable, going out to after hours bars, getting into other drugs and other groups of friends who didn't, you know, we didn't really. Um, I decided New York's the problem. I'm going to move to Paris. So that seems like the answer because who doesn't want to live in Paris? So I had saved up enough money to move to Paris. And my plan was that I would meet my husband who would own a vineyard in the South of France. And we would live in this chateau and make wine. Like I totally had this fantasy that that's why what was going to happen. And what ended up happening was I hit bottom. I was taken out of my away from, you know, Brooklyn and all of that noise. And I realized, um, I was away from all my family and I realized that like, I was miserable. Like it didn't matter where I was. I was, I was in Paris in the summertime. I had, I could go to all the museums, which I did. And it was just like, not, it was like, things just did not penetrate me. I was, um, I, I became so depressed again that I was suicidal and I won't go into the whole thing, but I went to Al-Anon because all the people in my lives were alcoholics. I don't know why. And I thought, why are all the people in my lives alcoholics? But I saw this ad for Al-Anon and it was English speaking. And I said, okay. And after I did a little bit of Al-Anon, my sponsor in Al-Anon said to me, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? Because I think, 
I'm tired of the drama. She was like, I'm tired of listening to your stories. I'm tired of you getting embroiled with this person and that person and having this. She was like, I think, you you know, you might want to go to some open AA meetings. And for whatever reason, I did, you know, and I started going to some open AA meetings. And then I would walk out and say, whew, I'm glad I'm not like those people. And I would go <laughs> and I would go down to the corner store and I would buy a plastic like water bottle full of wine. And I would take that home because it was like 20 francs. And I would take that home and I would drink alone in my little attic apartment and no problem. And I went and then at one of the meetings, someone gave me a big book. And I was like, no, but this belongs to the group because it had like women's big book study written on it. And they were like, it's okay. They were like, <laughs> please take it. So I was like, okay. So I started reading the big book at home while I drank my wine. And, um, <laughs> and I got to the part where it said, um, if you don't think you're an alcoholic, just don't drink for a year. And I said, aha, I found it. I found the solution. Don't drink for a year. That's what I'll do. I just won't drink for a year. And so then I like sat on my hands, white knuckling it for six days. <laughs> and I somehow I, and I really just stayed, I stayed at home as much as I could because just going by the cafes was like too much, you know, but someone invited me out to this poetry reading and I thought, Oh, how innocent, you know, a poetry reading. Of course, when I got there, there was wine and poetry. I didn't hear a single thing that they said. I was really trying not to drink anything. And someone had put like half a cup of wine on the table, like in front of me, no one was drinking it. And they had said that they were out of wine. And I kept saying the whole time I was just mentally obsessed. Whose wine is that? Who would leave that there? Is it okay if I drink it? There's no more wine. Oh no, you're not supposed to drink anyway. Ivy, just leave it. Anyway, at the end of the poetry reading, someone had gotten more wine. And I went over to the snack table and I went to get some pretzels. I literally went to get some pretzels and my hand just went like this. And and I just drank it down and someone said, oh, Ivy, some of us are going next door for a drink. Would you like to come? And I said, yes. I said, yes, like with every cell in my body. I went out with these people. I started talking shit about the poets. I was saying how, you know, how stupid it was and how cliche everything was. And I ended up um, with these two expats who were like just drinking and drinking. And then the people who had invited me out for a drink had had a drink. And then they went home and I was like, what? And I ended up in this after hours bar with these two guys that I had just met and um, was drinking everyone's drinks and was singing and was like, just how I always was. Right. And like pushing these guys off of me. Right. Um, And I went into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and like this thought came to me from out of the ether that said, you know, the jig is up. Like, I don't know why it's like, I had a little bit of AA in my head And it was just enough of reading the big book and listening to other people to say, you have this thing, you know, you didn't mean to drink. You had no defense against the first drink. As soon as you had one, you had to, you kept drinking. You ended up exactly where you always end up, no matter if you're in Paris or New York or Atlanta or college or high school, it doesn't matter who you're with. This is, this is you. This is the truth. And I saw it in my eyes. This is the truth. And I ended up getting home safely. And the next day I went to a meeting and I stood up for the first time shaking and crying in a very dramatic fashion saying, I think I'm an alcoholic. I don't know. I think I didn't mean to drink last night. I, I blah, 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 blah. So, and then, you know, people came up to me afterwards and, um, gave me their phone numbers and took me up to the secretary who, I will never forget was a large woman who was wearing this like black shawl with like, it reminded me of like one of those lampshades in like a brothel. Like it had those fringes, fringes and tassels and fringes and all sorts. And she had like this beret. She was like very, and she had this huge big book that was like thumbed, you know, it had to be 40 years old and was written and highlighted in. And she had a 12 and 12 and, I said, but I don't think that I'm that bad and blah, 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 blah. And she opened up the 12 and 12 and showed me a line that was highlighted that said, um, like long before we realized it, our 
drinking was no mere habit. It was the beginning of a fatal progression. Um, I paraphrase, but that struck me. Um, and you know, someone took me out to coffee and they talked about themselves the whole time. <laughs> and I, I kept trying to get a word in cause I wanted to talk about my problems. Right. I want to talk about me. And she just told me her, her story of her drinking and how she drank just like, you know, just like Bill did when he first talked to Bob, like that was the first time that it worked is that he wasn't, he wasn't, Bill wasn't talking about God. I found God. He was talking about, I I'm just like you, I'm a drunk, just like you. And that's what that woman did to me for me. And it started to, it started to sink in that, Oh, if she's like me, but now she's got 25 years sober or whatever it was. It didn't matter if it was 30 days. Maybe I could have that too, you know? And I haven't had, uh, I didn't have to, I haven't had to take a drink since, since that day, since that day I walked in and said, I might be an alcoholic. I didn't believe in God at the time I'd had, you know, a roller coaster ride with, with my spiritual, spiritual, uh, spirituality is the word. Um, <laughs> up until that point, I had, didn't even think that, I was an alcoholic. Even that day, I didn't think that I was an alcoholic. I said in meetings, I have alcoholic tendencies and everyone would laugh (laughs) and they would say, keep coming back. And I did. And the more I came, the more I started to understand that I do, that I do have this disease. And the more I understood that my bottom was enough for me, you know, and it was actually a lot lower than what I had thought because what I've come to realize and what I really appreciated about, about the big book stories is that the stories are all different, right? There's like the categories of like, they stopped in time and then these other, and then like the real low bottom ones. And it's like, the circumstances don't even matter. Like the fact that I was like living in Paris and like, you know, was 29 and still had an apartment to go back to and hadn't lost my family completely didn't matter because inside I was completely bankrupt. Like I wanted to kill myself. So it doesn't matter if I'm where I'm living or it's, if I kill myself, then that's it, you know? And, um, what's, what's funny about that day too, that became my sobriety date is that it was October 31st, which was the best day to party. It was like, always my favorite holiday, um, because you could just go crazy, um, in an even more extravagant fashion of costumes and wigs. Oh, 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, and all the drugs and all the clubs and all the bar hopping. And then here I was, um, that was my sobriety date. And I remember kind of walking away from coffee with this woman and I was kind of in a daze and thinking about my life. And this is no joke. I went to one of the big gardens. I don't remember which one. And there was a gazebo and kids were running around and they had little like witch costumes. Like it was Halloween and there were leaves on the ground. And I remember sitting somewhere near this gazebo and someone is in the gazebo playing. I, I'm not lying when I say this amazing grace on like a violin. I'm trying to remember which instrument it was. I think it was a violin, but they were playing amazing grace. And I was like, I know the words to that. It's like, I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. And, um, it felt very profound to me that I was being given, um, this new lease on life and this way up and out of alcoholism that, was, uh, about to change the whole trajectory of my life. And I do think it's interesting, like, you know, I'm not like a, I'm not, uh, like a Wiccan or anything, but during that time, I mean, don't they talk about like the veil being very like thin, like October 31st and November 1st and like into the spirit world. And so I got kind of into like, Oh, maybe this is all like a message. And (laughs) anyway, the point is that I kept, I did keep coming back and I was very fortunate that I wasn't, I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't have anything else to do. I would go to a meeting. I would go out for coffee. I would go to another meeting. I would go out to dinner. 
I would like get through the day one day at a time. And I was, um, you know, I got sick. I was sweating. I got really sick from like detoxing and I just would show up to the meetings. Um, and I got my 30 day chip there. And then, um, I had to go back to New York. And so when I did, I knew of a woman there who was in AA somehow, and I got in touch with her and she took, started taking me to meetings in New York. And, um, my first home group there was in Brooklyn, this place called Park West. And it's, it, Tim made me think of it because he was talking about like open and closed meetings. This was, um, uh, what they called a single purpose meeting. And they had a big placard up that said single purpose meeting. And like, they really only wanted you to talk about alcohol. And, um, and it was kind of like all these old grumpy guys and, (laughs) you know, um, but it was my first home group. I mean, I met my first sponsor there. There were a good group of women there. Um, and it worked for me for a while. I think what's so wonderful about AA is that there are so many different types of meetings, especially if you're in a big city or in a big area like the Bay Area where you can find your people. You can find the, the place that's comfortable for you. If you don't like a, what a speaker said, you didn't like their vibe, you didn't get anything out of their share, oh, well, go to another meeting. Like you'll You'll hear something. It took me a long time to hear my story from somebody, but eventually I did. And, and if you haven't already, I know that you will too, because that's just how it works. It's like one alcoholic talking to another and sharing their experience, strength and hope, you know? Um, so I, have had a lot of sponsors. I was talking to my friend today when we were getting our pedicures about how, you know, um, relationships are hard, you know, and what I learned early on (coughs) in the rooms was AA is a really great place to practice, you know, how to, I mean, it taught me everything. It was like, it was like kindergarten for me. It was like, how do you show up? Like, how do you show up and how do you have a commitment? How do you be committed to something? How do you help another person? How do you, um, how do you be honest with somebody? Uh, and my sponsors all had a hand in like helping to like shape me into a functioning sober woman. And, (laughs) And, um, you know, I, just to talk a little bit more about sobriety, you know, after I got a year, um, I thought that maybe I was done. I was like, I think I'm good. Like, again, like alcoholism is like, it's cunning, baffling and powerful. Like it was kind of like you weren't, again, you weren't that bad, this, that, and the other thing. But, um, what had really happened was I had gone against you know, a a common wisdom, not a rule to not get into a relationship in the first year or make any major changes. And I did get into a relationship when I had about six months. And, um, and so I, I isolated myself from a lot of women who were like, what are you doing? That guy is bad news. You know, like what? And I was like, screw you, you know, I'm going to do what I want. And, um, you know, it almost took me out. And so I was like, by one year, I was like, I'm miserable. I feel like I don't feel like I'm connected to people in the program. I just put all my eggs in this like relationship basket that was like super unhealthy and not good for me and not good for my sobriety. And I went to a meeting and I shared that and I shared how like I was alone. I just had a year and I was done. I didn't think this worked for me. And for whatever reason, I decided to say all of these things in a meeting that I had never gone to before. And these two like curly haired girls came up to me and they were like, you should come to our meeting. And I was like, what? And they were like, here's our phone numbers. 
you should come to New Garden. New Garden's great. This is our home group. You should come. So I was like, okay. So I started going to this meeting called New Garden, and it's uh, right across from Penn Station, and it w- would meet on Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I would go, and it was an hour and a half long with a 10-minute break in the middle. And it was excruciating. <laughs> and, every- <laughs> and everyone was so friendly and so freaking sober. And-, <laughs> and I remember this was really before, you know, this was before smartphones phones, uh, really was like 2002. And I remember I'd have my time out New York magazine <laughs> and I would sit at the ta- at one of the tables and start flipping through my magazine. Like, I don't need to talk to anyone. I mean, I was just terrified, you know, I was terrified of interacting with people. And I remember someone came up to me and said, honey, we don't read here. We, you know, we don't do that here. We don't read magazines here. She was like, go talk to Bridget. And Bridget was this like 90 year old, like old Irish ex nun who was in a wheelchair, had like diabetes and, you know, was the sweetest, most loving person. And they'd be like, go get Bridget some coffee, you know? And they like, they would just tell me what to do. Go, go shake the speaker's hand. My sponsor used to say, and I'd go, I don't want to. She was like, I don't care. You know, she was like, it's not what you want to do. It's what, it's what you have to do. If you waited around to what, till until you wanted to do something, you would never do anything. So you have to act your way into right thinking, not wait until you feel like doing something or figure it out in your mind and then take the action. So she taught me this sponsor who was one of those curly girls who I thought like, who is this little pipsqueak? She was younger than me, shorter than me, if you could believe it. She had two years sober and she became my sponsor. And she would be like, she would be like, um, you know, we're going to meet every week at this Starbucks before the meeting and we're going to read the book. And I was like, in public? She was like, she was, she was like, were you drunk in public? I was like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I was. Yeah. So even though I had had, you know, I started talking about how many sponsors I'd had. I'd had a few sponsors my first year, but I didn't get all the way through the steps. And when I got with Sue, I said, you know, I've been up to step six. Thank you. And she said, yeah. (laughs) She said, well, half measures avail us nothing. And she was right. I mean, this is at the time where I was like going to go back out. You know, I was not, I was not, I did not yet have the spiritual experience that you need, I needed to have in order to feel a real part of AA. And so, um, so then she kept me on, on Tinder hooks for about three months she would, I kept being like, come on, let's work the steps. Let's, you know, and she would say, so this was before we were were reading the book in in Starbucks, but she would, she was like, first you need to get a commitment, get a home group and, um, like call three new, something else I had to do. And, um, she wanted to see if I was serious. And, and so I would show up and I would make the coffee and I'd become really anal about everything with the cups and the, you know, and I, I re redesigned how you got your coffee because I thought it had better flow, you know, and <laughs> fun, better feng shui. You put the sugar at the end. So, you, you know, so it was very, very, very clever. Um, so finally, you know, I had to prove that I, that I wanted this because A's, you know, I'm sure you've heard this before, but AA is not for people who need it. And it's not for people who want it. It's for people who do it. And she had to see that I wanted to, I was doing it. Um, because we're a great bullshit artist and our disease is the biggest bullshit artist. And so when I'm not sober, then that's the lens through which I'm I'm acting and through which I'm seeing the world. And it's just not reality. So I'm so grateful to her for taking me all the way through the steps for the first time. And I'm grateful for every subsequent sponsor up till today where I'm back reading step two with a new sponsor and um, able to show up for my life in a way that I couldn't have imagined, you know, 18 years ago. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.